Well, it's my great pleasure to introduce Wal Thornhill as the 2011 John Chappelle Memorial Lecturer. Wal is a guru who knows his stuff and wears it lightly. That second bit is the rarity and the key. He has a Buddhist calmness and sense of timing. He responds to questions in the most succinct and helpful way. One wonders how any sort of universe, let alone an electric one, would function without a chap like him to turn to for solutions. It is that reassuring calmness that goes halfway to setting oneself up to find answers on one's own. Wall is a brilliant descriptivist. His web articles are usually reactions to mainstream press releases, salted with some occasionally un-Buddhist animus, but they are never reactionary. Rather, we keep seeing the illumination of phenomena that are anomalous in light of conventional cosmology through the light of a paradigm replete with scalable manifestations. As Wall says, there is nothing more powerful than a paradigm. The electric universe extends plasma cosmology and views all stars as electric discharge phenomena. Here is Wall Thornhill on stars in an electric universe. Thank you, A.P. David, for that uh, marvellous introduction. And thank you to the NPA for giving me the honour of uh, being able to present this particular lecture. I'd also like, when I'm giving thanks, to give thanks to the Thunderbolts team and all of those people from that team who've travelled uh, considerable distances as well. Uh, and also to Dave Talbot for organising uh, some of my fare here. <laughs> Stars in an Electric Universe. This was to be the title of my second paper. However, I sent it first, and somehow or another it ended up as this memorial lecture. I had intended instead to speak about the natural philosophy of the electric universe, because in my opinion, it is a return to natural philosophy, and I see myself more as a natural philosopher than anything else. So I've got a little sprinkling of the natural philosophy as an envelope around this particular topic, stars in an electric universe. I particularly like this little cartoon. You'll notice the alien is walking back to his partner in this uh, flying saucer, having spoken to an earthling, saying, you won't believe the cosmology they've come up with. <laughs> and that's my position. It is just another miraculous, unscientific creation story. It needs magic to begin, and also to maintain the narrative. It has its sacrosanct heroes and a god, of course a mathematician, because it's been invented by mathematicians. It is based on a firm belief that the universe is expanding because the evidence is already in that that's not the case. It denies evidence that can't be woven into the myth, and this is typical of any religion. In fact, Halton Arp compared modern cosmology with the medieval church. I think we've suffered through the last century the demise of physics. I've recently come to the position that Stephen Hawking was right. Philosophy is dead. Ever since Kant claimed that the world we observe is all in the mind. Because following Kant and Einstein, modern physics has followed that same path and is also dead but won't lie down. <laughs> I've recently read this book by David Harriman, I think his name is, called The Logical Leap and it's about induction in physics. And he says, the only means of knowledge is reasoning from observed facts, and that's been the story for me. The senses provide our only direct contact with reality. He goes on to say that induction is much more difficult and controversial than deduction, and why it is not reducible to the formalism of symbols. And that's particularly true on the path that I've taken. Deduction takes for granted the process of conceptualization. Induction is the conceptualization process itself in action. David Harriman goes on to say that a conceptual consciousness is an integrating mechanism and its product, knowledge, is an interconnected system, not a heap of propositions, which is largely how science is at present. And here's the man who taught me. I came across his book before I entered university. 
I was inspired by it, the approach, the logical leaps that uh, Velikovsky took, I had never seen before. When I got to university, I spent a lot of time in the sociology shelves of the university library, just picking books at random about myths and legends from around the world. And I found that the stories were understandable. They tended to leap off the page at me, and I could see how they related to what Velikovsky had uh, shown in his work. <coughs> I believe that he had made a case that needed to be answered. One of the things he did do, as well, was to throw down the gauntlet to astronomers by saying that electromagnetism was involved in the celestial mechanism. But this was ignored by astronomers who simply said, his work disobeys Newton's laws and therefore we can ignore you. They never picked up the gauntlet. In my view, cosmology must be a coherent natural philosophy and there can be no exceptions. If there's an exception, there's a problem with your cosmology. At present, the Big Bang doesn't address all, any of the big issues, in my opinion. I consider it a hopeless cosmology. It must provide insights into every discipline, including life itself and the human condition. And I think this is extremely important and something that Velikovsky felt also was important for our long-term survival. However, Modern specialised science is a hostile environment for such a quest. Now we do have a, an alternative cosmology that is accepted by the IEEE, the largest professional organisation in the world. It is based on the work of several Nobel Prize winners over the last century, has many successful predictions to its name, and also challenges the Big Bang. This is why astronomers ignore it. However, it doesn't handle unsolved problems in basic, particle and stellar physics. And this is the area that the Electric Universe tries to address. It tries to tackle these fundamental problems and in doing so offers a breakthrough and understanding of ourselves and our place in the universe. The Electric Universe, I believe, is an attempt at a convergent interdisciplinary cosmology. And the first thing to do is to get rid of some of the perpetrators of the demise of physics. In my view, science left the path of reason and objectivity in the early 1900s, and I'm sure I won't get much argument from the audience having sat through very many very interesting talks at this conference. Einstein and his proponents bequeathed us, in my view, a disconnected, incoherent universe that simply cannot function or give rise to life. And this is why so much magic has had to be invoked to try and make the theory fit the facts. And if the facts don't fit the theory, you can ignore them. Don Hodson, who I believe is a member of the NPA, has said everyone who takes relativity seriously believes in the reality of at least one direction in which one cannot point. And I thought that was a very succinct way of putting it. <laughs> I also believe that E equals MC squared, whether you attribute it to Einstein or anyone else, is the best known and most misunderstood equation in science. And I think this is a fundamental thing. In my view, the real meaning of E equals mc squared is that energy, mass, and the speed of light are all properties of matter. Electromagnetic energy, in my view, is stored in the orbital substructure of subatomic particles and manifests as their mass. The orbital substructure picture was given to me by Ralph Sansbury back in uh, about 1981. Therefore, the mass of a particle is a measure of how much energy is absorbed in deformation of a particle instead of its acceleration. This is an alternative way of looking at the particle accelerating ex experiments. Are you having trouble hearing me? <laughs> That's an Australian shirt. <laughs> <laughs> it's upside down. It buttons upside down. So. Okay, now I can turn around with it, that's better. And this means also that energy requires the presence of matter. There is no such thing as pure energy or dark energy. And we can't say anything about the beginning of the universe because we don't know how, what matter is or how it can be formed. And this is just one of the principles of physics. There is no creation or annihilation of matter. So we try to conform to the principles as well of physics. Therefore, electromagnetic radiation requires the presence of matter. It cannot go through a total vacuum. In other words, the ether. And uh, back in the 1970s, at the time that I met Velikovsky, there was a uh, 
Dr. Horace Dudley, who proposed that the ether was comprised of neutrinos. It was a very intriguing idea, and when I uh, came across Ralph Sansbury's view of particles being having internal structure, it occurred to me that uh, this particular idea answers a number of other questions, but I'll come to that later. The speed of light can be seen as a measure of the inertial response of subatomic particles to a varying near instantaneous electric force. This would make it a characteristic of the material medium. Now, a near instantaneous electric force implies a universal time, which I think also fits with many of the talks that I've heard here. And quantum energy transfers a measure of the fact that all subatomic particles are comprised of smaller orbiting systems, and they must have a resonant structure. Newtonian gravity. This was the ex-cathedra statement that was thrown at Velikovsky. It disobeys Newton's law. But what do we understand about Newton's law? Newton's law of gravity is instantaneous. It doesn't involve time. However, big G is a dimensional constant including mass. But mass is a variable, a measure of electromagnetic energy stored within that matter. So G can vary with the electrical stress in a body. And this is significant when you think that big G is the least well-established constant in the physics textbooks. We do have evidence that Earth's gravity was much less in the past. The scaling of muscle and bone strength show that dinosaurs could not have raised their bodies off the ground in today's gravity. And this article here shows that the birds couldn't have flown either. Those huge pterodactyls with their wingspan of a small aircraft. For them to move about, it's been calculated that Earth's gravity needed to be about one third of today's. So therefore, the global extinction of the dinosaurs required something far more than just a simple impact. In other words, we do not understand gravity, the basis of Big Bang cosmology. We need new concepts. As David Harriman says in his book, just as valid concepts can propel science forward, invalid concepts can stop it. And I think we've been stopped for the last century. These are statements from astronomers. Charge separation in space is impossible. And I remember the kind of argument that I got at university, and that is, you calculate the amount of energy required to separate all of the positive charges and the negative charges in a teaspoon of salt and it comes out of such a phenomenal figure that you, you just dismiss the idea that charge separation can occur in space. And of course, there's electricity in space, but it doesn't do anything. I did the postgraduate astrophysics course in London when I was working there, and I went up to the lecturer in plasma physics the plasma physics semester at the end of the semester and said, when do we do anything to do with electrical currents and electrical discharges in plasma? He said, oh, we don't do that. We come to Hans Alfain, who's uh, the father of plasma cosmology. To Alfain, the Big Bang was a fable devised to explain creation, so he saw through it. And Fred Whipple said, Alfane's theory must be mastered if further progress is to be made in understanding the universe. But Alfane himself, despite winning a Nobel Prize, was marginalised. His successful predictions did not lead other scientists to adopt his program, but only to accept the existence of the predicted phenomena. And what kind of science is that? This is by Stephen Brush, who published this in the, uh, one of the IEEE plasma journals. Plasma cosmology and the electric universe can inspire, in my opinion, a scientific revolution of unparalleled scope. We see on the left there a planetary nebula and a plasma discharge tube, just as a, an example of the similarities. And they hinge on one simple question in both cases, plasma cosmology and the electric universe, does electricity play a role in the universe? <laughs>